where do we start from? So we start from the beginning. Where is the beginning of a fluvial system? The beginning of a fluvial system is at a catchment where you have some, you have mountains or hills. It's where the rainwater is being collated and then it becomes progressively from streams, rivulets or streams, it becomes a conspicuous river. Now, in Australia there aren't that many mountains. So what we don't or what you don't see very much is exactly this part of the river system the one near the mountains. You have to go to New Zealand or you have to go to the Himalayas or to the Alps or the Sierras in the United States. You can also have, if you go into the Himalayas, glaciers. And when they melt, they discharge water. So let's start here. Mountains have very steep slopes. So when the current, when the water is collected in a channel, so the water is connected, collected in a channel, the river has, the river have a channel, water starts rushing down and it has a very high energy. So if we remember the Ullström diagram, that very high energy can be like a velocity that it's over 10 meters per second. It can start, I mean it transports pebbles, the large sizes. So it is capable of eroding and transporting maybe boulders up here and then progressively this, the, the grain size will decrease from pebbles, gravel. And so in this part of the river system we have the coarser size. that are being transported and deposited. There are cases, and this is very frequent in all desert regions, where you have like big thunderstorm every once in a while. Now, if we are in a like in a situation like this, where night and day temperatures are quite different, we know that the water that during the day melts and goes into tiny little fractures in the rock, at night freezes and blasts the rock, so it forms big chunks I mean, big grain, big boulders, big pebbles. And these will be angular, remember, angular. Now, due to the force of gravity alone, with no water, they might just fall towards the bottom of the mountain. So they will form a rock if when, when the clasts, large clasts, are cemented, compacted, and are angular like this. This type of rock consisting of large fragments, angular, is a breccia. So the breccia, 
used to be a sediment like this, a slope scree, for example, where the only transport is maybe for the top of the mountain, or not the top, but from the top of a cliff to its bottom. So there is not much transport. And that's why it's so angular. Especially water doesn't do much. Let's take a second case. And the second case is when there is water. So the fragments that have been produced by this blasting remain there, but then arrive like a, this big thunderstorm, and the water goes into a channel that can be called a wadi uh, or an arroyo and start to transport this material. But not just this material. It's a big thunderstorm. Let's suppose that uh, we have produced uh, several different types of sediment. Uh, for example, if we here have a glacier like that, it might have formed uh, smaller sediments. Or weathering the interaction you know, between atmosphere, humid atmosphere, and the rock might have just produced very small grains. For example, flakes, if it started to weather a granite, flakes of mica, or grains of quartz, of grains of feldspar. This big thunderstorm picks up that large grains the small, and the small grains, and like a flash flood, brings everything downhill towards, towards where? Towards where is a basin. A basin can even be a valley, like Death Valley. It's just a place where the sediment can be collected. So we are in Death Valley now. There shouldn't be any snow. The sediments are brought down. And in, we shall imagine that in this condition, there is a very tiny valley. So the channel is in this valley. And here there is the plain. And imagine the water coming towards me, carrying all this material from the larger stuff to the small stuff, and exiting the valley where, for like here at the end of the slope, and finding a flat plain. You know what the water does? The water spreads out. like a fan. It forms a fan. And because it is associated to water, to a stream, it's called an alluvial. This is a you. Alluvial fan. So if you look, if you Google map, Death Valley, you will see that it is full. The bottom of the Death Valley is a coalescence of alluvial fans. And the alluvial fans migrate. So every time this happens, or so every huge storm, maybe it will prefer, the water will preferentially go this way and deposit here or go that way and deposit there. So it forms what are called lobes. So this grows like this. 
and each of these lobes will be due to the discharge of one of these, <laughs> let's call it catastrophic floods, that at time change their direction. And that's why, in the end, you have such a beautiful fan. The internal structure of this fan is quite complicated. But one of the things that by now you should somehow hypothesize is about the type of, I mean, the distribution of the grain size from here to the bottom of the fan and the sorting. So is this going to be well sorted? How about here? Now let, let's uh, think about the fact that you have a body of water full of sediments, so it looks muddy, that all of a sudden goes out of the valley and spreads. So it, the, the velocity de decelerates real quickly and it spreads at the bottom of the valley. So what I think that we should find is not a very well sorted sediment and probably we find a mixture of grain sizes. Because what happens? I told you that the water comes out, spreads, but also it, some of it will flowing along a major channel. So where the major channel is, so there will be major channels through time. Where the major channel is, is where the highest energy is. So let's try to make a section. So slice like a cake this alluvial fan. So imagine that this is our alluvial fan. And we are slicing it like this. I'm trying to make this look again. I'm not very good at drawing, but I'm trying to create this block diagram. So in time, you also will be able to create your own block diagram. So this is the top of the alluvial fan here. And this is the bottom, more or less, here. In this part, oh, in this part, we might have a channel with large boulders. And here, we will not, we, in the channel, so imagine this is the channel. So this is the surface today. The grain size will be finer. What happens around, and, and it will decrease from here to there. So from here, it will keep de decreasing. Water that spreads out of the channel will create like a sheet flood. And here it might deposit sand, and here it might deposit silt. This is the symbol for silt, and this is the symbol for sand. In the end, we can 
if we go farther away, we can just have actually mud. So symbol of mud is this without the dot. So mud, silt, sand. Because it's a sheet flow, so it's still flowing, maybe here it forms ripples. So we will have a little bit of cross stratification somewhere here, which we see here. We see it on the flanks, right? So cross stratification, this is the direction of the current, sorry, so cross stratification, cross stratification, cross stratification, a little bit of a parallel lamina. And here, parallel. And there will be an erosion surface because the channel where there is the highest energy keeps eroding. So if, for example, we move this, uh, I mean, the, the, the channel migrates, and an older time, maybe rather than having the sand here, we okay, may find conglomerate. Because now we are going deeper in time. So here was the channel, and then we can find a conglomerate with smaller grains, and then in the end, we may even find sand. And here, a little bit of erosion filled with sand, and then parallel, parallel beds. And some other time before, you had again cross lamina and parallel beds. Maybe if we move farther back towards the mountain, this can even have breccia. And we will have a poorly sorted conglomerate because the current dumps everything just once it comes out of the valley. So alluvial fans are characterized by a mixture of grain sizes. The grains are rounded but not extremely well rounded because the transport hasn't been very much. And it will be one of the environment of deposition where it's most easy you find the larger grain size so when they become rocks they become they become coarse conglomerates and these coarse conglomerates will be associated with sand and silt and only in the valley you might find mud in the case of Death Valley, when the water then has left all its charge of grain and it's carrying only ions, you can have gypsum and anhydrite, a gypsum pen, which will be far away from your alluvial fan. Now, if you follow all this idea, I mean, all, all this model I have drawn. It becomes clear that in order to understand the environment of deposition, which in this case is the alluvial fan, you cannot just look at one single outcrop. Because maybe if you, if, like, let's suppose that this is, like five kilometers or six kilometers 
in, in diameter. If you just find a little bit, an outcrop with a little bit of conglomerate, which is matrix supported, well, it's not necessarily an alluvial fan. It can be something else. It might be deposited by a different type of river. The only ingredient you need is a flow of water that is capable of deposit of transporting large pebbles and sand and silt, and then a means by which this is deposited together with sediments at the same time. So, what should you do? Well, you should look for more outcrops in the area and then look at the relation, relationships between the rocks that you find, that you observe. Well, I kept telling you rocks, but we don't actually call them rocks. I still haven't introduced this concept. Fascius. In Latin, it means face. So it is the appearance of the rock. When I say conglomerate, okay, conglomerate is a sedimentary rock. But apart from that, what other kind of information do you get? Very little. Apart from, yes, okay, it's a sedimentary rock that is consisting of clasts that have been transported, transported by a water current. But what else is it telling you? Nothing more than that. In order to go from a rock to the environment of deposition, it is important that we look at all aspects of that rock and at the relationship between different facies, meaning different rocks with their different characteristics. So what are the characteristics? If we look at what I have crudely drawn, what we see is that we can have an association of a conglomerate. And this conglomerate, let's look at this, well, is poorly sorted. But it seems to be, the cluster seems to be touching each other. So it is grain supported. And you know what? I didn't really draw that really nice because I forgot the, the clust could be aligned. So there is something called imbrication. I'm looking at a sediment, a structure. So. I put down also imbrication, grace, and what else? I start looking for fossils. Maybe you know, I, I find, if I'm lucky, relics of wood. So I also mark the fossils. All this poorly sorted, grain-supported uh, conglomerates, uh, 
uh, with fragments of wood and imbrication. That's a fascius. I have described a fascius, the aspect of that rock. So it's not anymore a simple conglomerate. This conglomerate has become something more. It has become a fascius. It has become a lot more information about the environment of deposition, about what and where this sediment was deposited. Now, again, if I take this, oh, I need a little bit of space. Let's take this, and we have called that sand. And then when it becomes a rock, we find the sandstone again. What is sandstone going to tell you? Well, sandstone is, yeah, it's a rock consisting of sand. But the sand can be coarse, so around two millimeters, or can be fine less than one millimeter. The sand can be all the same size or a variety of sizes. It can be massive or you can find sedimentary structure. It can consist all of one mineral or of diverse, diverse minerals. And again, I mean, Within the sand, you might find silt. So the grains might be immersed in a fine, or associated to a finer matrix. So let's, when you get to the sandstone, you need your hand lens. And let's see the sandstone here. Okay. It's composed mostly of grain in the order of two millimeter. The grain consists of different rocks. So maybe we have some metamorphic rocks, some igneous rocks, some dolomite. That's something you find in Death Valley. And then we look again, yeah, it is associated with silt. And grains seem to be rounded. And, but it's also associated with granules. So we have stuff that is four millimeters. So again, maybe it's not a very well sorted sand. But it's got cross bedding. Oh, cross lamina. So maybe it's Grain, again, maybe it's grain supported, poorly sorted. Maybe we don't see any evident fossil or some roots, I don't know, rootlets. And we have cross bedding. Again, from sandstone. What we have described now, it's a fascius. The next step is to look at the relation between this fascius, the conglomerate, and that fascius, the sandstone. What is the passage between the two? Because if you look at this or that, the implication is that you you don't have a bed that is continuously consisting of the same thing. For example, a bed all of sandstone with cross lamina. It seems more that we have lenses. So you have a lens of conglomerate that makes transition to a body of 
sandstone with cross bedding. So then you go and look, what is, you know, like, what is the relation? And maybe you find out that these conglomerate as a bottom, so the bottom of the lens of conglomerate, which is like this. And so, ah, that looks like erosion to me. So that is a river channel. And if adhesion to the river channel, you have a body of sand with ripples, and that could be the bank. Could be a bar. So that's why we have to look at sedimentary rocks uh, more in a holistic way. Look at all the characteristics and define fascias. And then the definition of fascias is really bizarre because in practice a fascias is a body of rock of sedimentary rock or sediments with characteristics which are different from another fascias, are different from what surrounds them. So that's the definition of fascias. In practice, what, what does this definition mean? It means so that you have to look at your sedimentary rock and describe it carefully and describe all the characteristics, the texture, the structures, and the fossils, the bedding, the boundaries between the rocks that are above and below, And from that, you get to the environmental deposition. <laughs>